everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the organizer of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESTCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERTIP and ESTCP by Dr. Herb Nelson, followed by a sneak peek at a few of the upcoming webinar in CERTIP and ESTCP's webinar series. Following Herb's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of this event. Today's webinar features two speakers who will discuss acoustic methods for underwater munitions. First, Dr. Joe Bucaro will present his findings from a CERTIP-funded project on searching for buried underwater UXO using structural acoustic sonars. Joe's presentation will be followed by a short Q&A session. Second, Dr. Kevin Williams from the University of Washington will discuss low-frequency acoustic scattering by underwater UXO and its use in classification based on a recent Acoustical Society of America special, special session on this topic. His presentation will be followed by a short Q&A session, and then we will conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A session involving both of our speakers. Today's broadcast will be listened only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions in advance of the Q&A session. With over 240 attendees on today's call, it is logistically challenging to open all the lines for oral questions. Uh, therefore, the phone lines will remain listen-only throughout these presentations. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Herb Nelson, who has been serving as the CERTUP and ESCCP Program Manager for Munitions Response since 2007. Prior to that, Herb was a research chemist at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, where his work focused on the detection and classification of buried UXO. And with that, I turn it over to you, Herb. Great. Thank you very much, Rula. I would also like to join Rula in uh, welcoming you all to the first of the munitions response seminars, although it's about the fifth or sixth in the series. First, a little introductory material before we get to Joe and Kevin. As many of you know, CERTIP is the uh, Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, which was established by Congress in 1991. It's a partnership between DOD, DOE, the Department of Energy, and EPA. CERTIP's mission is to identify and address high-priority environmental science and technology opportunities, focusing on DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. The companion program, ESTCP, which, as this slide says, is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, is where we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments from CERTIF, for example, or other research programs, and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all these ESCCP demonstration is the ultimate transition, so we really look for uh, acceptance by both DOD stakeholders and regulators. So there are five program areas in these two programs. Uh, four of them, the first four, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the second uh, two through five are ESTCP and CERTIP and energy and water. The first one is only an ESTCP project. These are complementary programs, so much of the CERTIP research transitions through to ESTCP. That research often occurs at the lab and pilot scale in munitions, more often it has a field component, not so much in the others. ESCCP demonstrations are certainly aimed at the pilot and field scale. Some of the uh, focus areas have supporting laboratory research. That's not so often in munitions response. So today, of course, as I've said it several times, we're focusing on the munitions response uh, program area. As you can see, we really have two missions, both munitions on land 
and we focused almost exclusively in the last three or four years on classification. By that we mean uh, determining what's a hazardous buried munition and what's a, just a harmless piece of fragment. Really, the, the uh, munitions on land portion of our program is coming to a close. FY15 is really our last year, and we are shifting our attention to munitions underwater. There are really three areas of munitions underwater that we are, uh, have interest in, both wide area and detailed surveys to find these munitions underwater, cost-effective recovery and disposal techniques once these things have been found, and then a whole range of topics that uh, bear on the characteristics of these munitions underwater, what environment they're in, and very importantly to the DOD, what their mobility is in energetic environments. The seminars today, of course, will focus on the first of these topics, wide area and detailed surveys, using acoustic methods. As you can see from this slide, this gives you the next four that are upcoming in this series. We really are highlighting the research from all of the five program areas of CERTIP and ESDCP. Uh, the next two are, are based on the energy and water on February the 19th and lead-free electronics, which is in our weapon systems and platform area. These, uh, you can find more information about these at, off the CERTIP and ESCCP website. In fact, there's the uh, URL listed on this slide where you can go to register for upcoming webinars. Registration is open now for the next one and will open soon for the uh, lead-free electronics webinar. And with that, I would like to return the uh, control to Ruler, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Herb. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joseph Bucaro. Joe is a senior research scientist with Exet Inc. under contract with the Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. Joe's current areas of research include the development of structural acoustic technologies for the detection and classification of underwater targets. Joe has served as a principal investigator on several sort of projects. He has co-authored more than 100, uh, 100 and 20 journal articles and holds 26 U.S. patents. And prior to joining AXET, uh, Joe had a long career at the Naval Research Lab where he both participated in and managed hundreds of research programs in physical acoustics. So with that, I turn it over to you, Joe. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Joe. And I um, am pleased to have the opportunity to uh, present it in this format. I've never done this before and wondering what it's going to be like talking to no one that I can see. Agenda is shown here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background and, and then show you some typical UXO spectral uh, characteristics since that's what the sonars are, are going to be using. And then the techniques split naturally into two high-resolution imagers, and, uh, and then structural acoustics, which are at much lower frequencies. I'll sh focus at that point on the structural acoustics part, and I'll show you some images developed uh, from work done in St. And Andrews Bay in the Gulf of Mexico, and then some acoustic color work uh, in the Gulf as well. So, the need. As uh, some of you may know, there are many active former and military, uh, former and active military sites that have ordnance ranges that are nearby uh, adjacent waters, and where it is known or highly suspected that uh, UXO exists. And the CERTIP Munitions Response Program, uh, which we call MRP, the goals require the development of sonar technology that can detect not just proud but bury targets as well, and further to separate those detections into UXO versus non-UXO to make the remediation process much uh, more cost effective. Now, the underwater UXO sonar problem, at least uh, from our perspective, is, is a difficult one. Certainly uh, compared to the, the terrestrial problem, uh, which has, you know, a decade or so uh, jump on, on what's being done underwater, and that's for these three reasons. Acoustic propagation in the water itself can be complicated. I'll show you a couple examples of that. The sediment properties, uh, the sediment in which the targets probably are buried vary. The sediments can change spatially as you move along the sediment surface, and they certainly can change in time because of environmental effects, currents, and so forth. And there are, of course, very, very many 
of these uh, UXO types, a few of them shown here that we're interested in, uh, and the false targets as well, just a couple of the really almost unlimited uh, variety of natural and man-made clutter objects that return echoes pretty much in the same, uh, at the same level that uh, the targets that we're interested in do. So environments, um, here's some examples of why, why it's complicated. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner is, is the uh, uh, Mare Island facility, which has since been closed down, but uh, the South Shore area, you can kind of picture yourself that, you know, due to the combination of uh, piers, bulkheads, things of that sort, there are areas where water, the, the surface, the sediment has been dredged and areas where it has not been dredged, uh, presents an acoustic problem, obviously. And if you look over on the right, in the Chesapeake Bay area, um, where there are a number of former ranges, uh, problems uh, just as complicated. In fact, uh, along one of the shores there, uh, the, uh, near the machine gun range, that was an actual an intentional uh, deposit area for many of these munitions. And in this kind of environment here, the, uh, the water depths vary significantly as you move uh, from place to place. And there's a lot of recreational vehicles and such in that area. And if you move on to the coasts, east coast, west coast, uh, there still is complication. Uh, as the picture shows down below, uh, there's a range of, of conditions. For example, if you're in near the surf zone area where the sediments are not saturated, uh, these can be poroelastic. They can have uh, shear waves and, and, and longitudinal waves and, and so forth. And as you move on out into the area where the sediments are saturated, there still are so many different types of sediments that their absorption properties, their sound speed properties vary quite a bit. And even in the water column, shown in that little piece on the right, uh, the sound velocity profiles vary with temperature, so they're seasonal. And, and, and acoustic waves can bend downward, upward, and so forth, depending on, uh, on those uh, effects. The Navy Munitions Response Program uh, is currently focused on shallow water areas where we know there are, have been uh, uh, UXO uh, placed and where munitions are covered by, just arbitrarily, 120 feet or less of water. And when you move into the sort of surf zone area, that is considered terrestrial in this program because you could always wait for the tides to go out and, and use terrestrial techniques. So the focus of what I'll continue to talk about now is in this sort of coastal area here in the green box uh, where the waters are maybe 8 feet to 120 feet deep and where we're looking at sonars that are sort of down looking, maybe a little bit side looking, but not long, long range way out to the side and where the sonars are a combination of monostatic, as shown on the lower piece, and, and, and bistatic, where receivers and sources are not exactly co-located. So here are some of the acoustic signals that uh, are typical of the UXO we're looking for. These, these measurements were made in our facility uh, a while ago, uh, very broadband, uh, up from a few kilohertz up to 140 kilohertz, very high resolution and space and, and, and in terms of aspect angle high resolution and you sort of see the, the, the details there. And if you look at the, the, the highest level, typically here you see about minus ten D B target strength level. And what that would mean, just to set the calibration here a little bit, uh, if your receiver was three meters away from the target that you're insonifying, uh, we would have an echo that's about ten percent the pressure level of the incident field. If you go out to 20 meters, that ratio drops to about 1%. So those are the sort of signal levels that, that we are forced to deal with. Uh, now, if you, I, I should go back one just for a second. If you look at this, obviously these returns are very angularly dependent. And uh, since we don't know what angles these things would be presented to our sonar, uh, it's useful to sort of integrate the target strength across all the angles, and we call that random aspect target strength. And uh, that is shown for two of the targets here um, on the right for a large 155 millimeter shell and a small cartridge. 
And those are the integrated averages uh, uh, of those two target strengths. And we did a simple little uh, model a, a, a while back in which we asked the question, what are the ranges that we could see these targets at under the conditions shown down below on the left? And for those kinds of targets, with those target strengths, you can see that even down to very low frequencies, down to below 10 kilohertz, we can still get to ranges of about 150 feet. So as I mentioned in the introduction, the, the sonar is naturally split into two regimes. One is the high-frequency imaging regime, where the sound is scattered from basically predominantly the surface of the target and where the wavelengths are so short that one gets very high resolution, and at the lower frequencies into what we call structural acoustic sonars, which are, in, uh, uh, by comparison to the upper frequency stuff, uh, under development. And if you look at the display, uh, the semi-log display of an actual UXO target strength on the right, you can see that right where the uh, structural acoustic regime uh, begins, below 20 kilohertz, you see a lot of features in angle frequency space that we believe can be useful for fingerprinting, in a sense, the, the, the targets for uh, classification information. So here's a few examples of, uh, you're probably familiar with, some of the very high resolution sonars that are commercially available that uh, perform uh, really very, very well. This is a marine sonic side sand sonar shown up in the upper left. Um, it's on a tow body, and you can see it to the right of it uh, some nice spectacular images of ripples on the sur surface of the sediment and uh, an image of this so-called manta mine in the very top of that is about a third of a meter in, in dimension so that you see uh, the kinds of resolutions you could obtain. And then in the, the vehicle below, which is a Remus uh, autonomous underwater vehicle where the marine sonic sonar is mounted, you see images of proud 155 millimeter projectiles. And if you blew these up, you can indeed see a lot of detail enough to really uh, classify that target. And one last example is a Klein 5000. Tow body is just shown on a tow body where it's producing some really nice images of lobster pots on the bottom uh, of, uh, uh, of the ocean. So we haven't said anything about acoustic absorption at this point. Uh, so the question is, the, what role does acoustic absorption play? And in the upper uh, figure, you see that the absorption in the water for most of the frequencies we're talking about, even up to a megahertz, are not an issue, uh, the, um, especially the ranges that I just uh, mentioned. However, if you look at the sediment absorption, and one example of which is shown below in the curve, some work uh, published by Williams, our next speaker, uh, you see that at the very high frequencies at which the, sonar, the uh, imaging sonars operate, and they're off the scale here, so if you look to the left, the frequency scale, if you went up way above a, a 100 kilohertz, you'd be up to those frequencies. You'd see that the absorption in dB per meter on the lower uh, abscissa would be 100, 200 dB per meter. And so one is not going to see buried targets through the sediment at these frequencies. But if you look at the, alt, uh, the structural acoustics regime, down below, say, 20, 25 kilohertz in the pink area, you see absorptions that are more like uh, several dB per meter. And since it's a two-way pass, as shown on the figure up on the top, energy down to the target, scattered from the target back up to the sediment, we still only get maybe 10 dB of total absorption. So these structural acoustic sonars are able to see these buried targets. Now, in the structural acoustic sonar, we don't have to give up on the pro prospect of imaging, uh, even though the wavelengths are very long. So, uh, you know, left to their own devices, the imaging uh, resolution would be uh, not very good. But one can implement SAS processing, and people have done that, in which, uh, the, uh, as you can see, uh, the sonar moves, say, in a linear track, and one uh, collects information coherently along the entire track. Uh, and so the aperture of the sonar, which is very small physically on the, t on the vehicle, becomes very large, and one gets uh, uh, resolutions that are typical of that, of that aperture. And uh, I mentioned here a couple of typical kinds of resolutions we think you get. 
a long track where that aperture is long, you, can, you might get somewhere down to about 10 centimeters. And a cross track where the resolution is dependent on the, frequ the, band, the frequency band, which, uh, again, is at lower frequency, so not so large, uh, worse, worse resolutions. But nonetheless, resolutions that could give you hints and clues as to what those targets are. So what do we have with the structured acoustic sonar? We have these constructs. We have images, and besides the three 2D images on the very left, we also have available something we've had some success with, which is filtering out the specular part of those images and getting an elastic highlight image that's shown there in that blue box. And then on the, other, on the right side, target strength. And to the extreme right is acoustic color, which is frequency versus angle uh, 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 maps. And there is a special case of that just shown to its left, which is the uh, single frequency two-dimensional target strength uh, uh, shown there. So let's uh, consider now as we go forward two sonars uh, uh, trying to operate doing what I would call structural acoustic sonar, uh, imaging or acoustic color. And it turns out that uh, over a decade ago, Stephen Schock of Florida Atlantic University developed uh, a really great system called BOSS, which means Buried Object Scanning Sonar. And uh, uh, you see two versions of it on the left. Lower left is a toe body version of it where the wings have uh, each uh, 80 sensors, uh, four rows of 20 each. And on the right, an AUV version of BOSS, which has 20 sensors on each wing. So let's look at uh, some images that are formed by such a system uh, out in a, a real marine, a marine environment. Uh, how do we form the images? Uh, this is depicted here. So as it says, uh, using the signals on the 40 receivers, or in the case of the, the other AUV, uh, the other tow body, 160 receivers, either one, uh, you know, the vehicle maps out uh, a very large synthetic array. And so we'll use the signals on the first 40 receivers uh, and from the first 40 pings and then use the imaging algorithm that's shown on the lower right to form uh, images of points in some volume where we're interested in seeing uh, a target. We then skip ahead, say, five pings, and then we use the next 40 pings uh, and do the same thing computing the same image points. We do that maybe 33 times. So at each image point, we have 33 numbers, and we choose the maximum number as representing the real magnitude of the multi-static image that's produced. And we can, of course, get uh, 2D images by going to, say, X, Y, and taking the, the maximum and Z, and, and the same for the other two. So here are some images form from the 160 boss uh, done um, a while ago now. You can see here 2009 by Paul Carroll. And he was imaging, attempting to image it in the St. Andrews Bay, which is about 39 feet of water, images of a buried cylinder that was three inches in diameter, 14 inches length, one that was half buried, shown uh, images shown on the left, and then one that was 30 centimeters buried shown on the right. And the red lines in the two depth images depict the sediment interface. And you see it does a fairly good job in, in, in showing the, the shape and size of those targets and its burial state. So jumping ahead now a few years to uh, uh, work that was done in the Gulf of Mexico using the other BOSS system, the AUV BOSS system, uh, data was collected on a fairly large target field in 60 feet of water. And I, I have to stop at this point and, and, and give credit to uh, the team that made this possible, the NS, uh, NSWC Panama City folks, Holtz, Richard Holtzapple, Joe Lopes, and Nick Pineda, uh, aided by Bluefin Robotics uh, expert Harvey Duplantis, uh, who made the AUV fly right and take the right data. And then the target burial team, Kevin Williams, who will speak later, and his diving team, aided by Mike Richardson, were able to bury in 60 feet of water 11 targets uh, that we studied. And uh, what are those targets? 
Uh, I show them here on this slide. Uh, the ones in the center uh, on this grid, these grids are in, uh, shown in two and a half meter blocks. These were targets that were already down on the surface to support another exercise. They had a lot of false targets like tires, uh, rocks, but also UXO. And the buried targets that were buried by Kevin and his team, we had three five-inch rockets buried over there on the left at those angles shown. We had five 155-millimeter projectiles shown on the lower uh, band at those angles, one mortar to the far right, a rock in the cinder block. And I might say that all the UXO targets were filled with the epoxy material uh, to, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, mock uh, what might otherwise be in there. This are, these are examples of the AUV flight pattern, uh, the sort of mow the grass, the patterns that were executed. The pink are the proud targets. The yellow are the berry targets that we're interested in here. Um, you can see these are east-west, north-south paths. We flew those at three meters and five meter uh, heights. Uh, here are images that were produced in the manner I described earlier from the berry targets. You could see the uh, in each case, in the upper right hand of each one of these sets of four, the plan view, and then where you see the red line, that's where the sediment interface is, and you see the two depth view images. And these images are fairly good. They give you a, a fairly a reasonable estimate of the, of the size uh, and, and burial state of the target. The last uh, three uh, are shown here on, on, this, on this slide. So just to summarize, uh, what we think we could do with uh, what we were able to do in Boss, uh, with Boss in the Gulf and St. Andrews Bay, the images. Here's a couple of comments. First, a few images incorrectly show a partially buried target when we knew we had buried it. Now, that is, we reckoned it with the fact that there was a small amount of sediment sloping, and when you're looking at a target uh, uh, projected away from the, t from the vehicle, more than say three or four meters, the sediment sloping comes into play and produces an ambiguity. There were also several horizontally buried targets where that looked like they weren't horizontally buried in the actual image. And we believe that might be due to a shift in burial orientation with time since there was a reasonable amount of time between the burial and actual, and actual runs. And the image target lengths are pretty much correct uh, given their sizes. The widths tend to be about twice the uh, actual dimension, and that's consistent with the resolution numbers shown on the bottom of this slide that I quoted earlier. So now uh, that moves, we can move on to acoustic color. Uh, that is to say, to what extent can we extract from these uh, BOSS measurements uh, what's called acoustic color or target strength versus frequency and aspect angle? And I'll uh, Let's see here, right here, excuse me. Uh, how do we obtain acoustic color? Uh, that's mapped out in this particular slide. First of all, we know a particular target center from its image. And at that target location, we do a little bit of SAS processing. So for a particular receiver, shown in that little blue dot, we'll take the neighboring receivers, uh, as shown in that uh, upper left-hand uh, blue uh, array, and we'll coherently add those signals together to get a little bit of SAS processing for each receiver signal. That is then the scattered acoustic pressure, which is a function of X, the location of the vehicle, Y, the location of the particular receiver on the wing, and frequency. And acoustic color is 20 log P sub Y, X, and W. So for a particular wing receiver, we will have mapped out an acoustic color spectrum. Here's one example of that, uh, obtained again in the BOSS for target N6, which was a horizontally buried uh, 155 millimeter howitzer. And you see the pattern shown here, frequency on the left axis, and then, I'm sorry, you could barely see it, but exposition of the vehicle. And I've shown you a little cartoon below where I've oriented or laid, or, uh, 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 keyed the vehicle to the position below of the actual buried target. So when the source receiver bisect that target, that's we call zero on the uh, abscissa above in the color display. 
So that would be the beam target response, and it's so labeled. And then off at 45 degrees, you see the extreme, the two extreme source receivers. That is what's called a filler elastic wave at quartering. We observe that effect in our sediment pool studies where energy is actually getting into the epoxy material. And then a return at a less than 45 degrees at the taper angle, and that's also a labeled. And I, I might also mention, not shown here, that we get these spectra also in our sediment pool facility, so we're quite convinced that we're measuring acoustic color uh, at sea. So how do we extract features from that acoustic color? Well, there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, here's one example that we first tried. It's a very high-dimensional feature. Basically, if you, show, you look at the little cartoon on the, on the right, we basically go at uh, 21 different receiver positions, meaning X positions of the vehicle, um, centered on the target uh, uh, closest approach, and we take the, pr the uh, complex value of the scattered pressure at each of those receivers. So there's two numbers for each one, and then we, we determine that for each of the 383 frequencies in our band. So we end up with, if you multiply those together, a 16,000-dimensional feature uh, for each receiver. Now, uh, a particular study we looked at is in circles in red, we chose uh, obvious uh, uh, non-UXO targets. Uh, most of them were proud, a rock, a panel target, a tire, and so forth. And the two buried that we had, a large rock, a cinder block, and then as targets, we took the buried green uh, targets filled with epoxy. So that was the first study. And we asked the question, to what extent could uh, that 16,000 dimensional feature be used to separate those targets? Now, we're not doing a test. We're just seeing to what extent would they separate. And uh, we did this by training an RBM classifier. Uh, we did that by using the even pings. Uh, and collecting data on every other, every other ping. And then we tested the algorithm once it was trained up uh, on, the odd, on the even pings, odd and even, I'm sorry. And then since we have that probability for each of the 40 Y receivers, we multiply those, those probabilities together, raise it to the 1 over 40th power, and that gives us the combinatorial probability that it is or it isn't a UXO. And since we used about five paths for each of these targets, there's, 90 tar there's 18 targets, we end up with 90 realizations for this study. And those are shown on the next slide where uh, the decision uh, line, the discriminant line is at 0.5 in probability space. You see all the Xs. Most of them are above. Most of the zeros, are, uh, the non-UX are below. There's two mistakes, one false negative in green, one false positive in red. But by and large, it suggests very strongly that this feature, for example, could be used to discriminate those. Of course, the challenge now is how to train an algorithm to do that. And um, in this regard, I'll mention one last uh, technical thing here. This is a, a, a trained a test exercise that we did in our sediment pool, so it's not in, in the ocean, but nonetheless, it was very successful. So instead of uh, the 16,000-dimensional feature, we went to the other extreme. This is a two-dimensional feature where the feature, one feature was the symmetry in the elastic image shown there on the left, and the two-dimensional target strength correlated against the template. So two numbers, correlation number, symmetry number. And we generated, with our numerical code, uh, STARS 3D, uh, 90 different degree uh, burial angles for one of the, tar the UXO targets. And we trained on only that data, only numerical data, and then we tested those targets shown in the right in our sediment pool. And we were very successful. It's a blind test, in a sense, of separating, testing, and calling out, this is a UXO, this is not a UXO. So... Uh, just to summarize quickly, then, the, uh, the results that we got out of the acoustic color studies, we believe accurate echo measurements, including color, for buried targets are possible using BOSS, uh, a suitably trained RBM algorithm, which is our next goal, uh, should be able to separate targets from that kind of data. And I'll mention one last thing in the third bullet, that uh, and since that, we've done some calibration work on the acoustic source, 
and that if we take that into account, we believe we will have even better performance. And then my last comment, my last slide is an overall summary, just to remind you that I believe if you're looking for proud targets in this kind of a water environment, the commercially available devices, uh, high-frequency images, are perfectly capable of detecting and identifying those. And structural acoustic sonars and data processing techniques I've discussed are under development and have already gone uh, a significant way in, in this problem. Uh, thanks uh, for your attention. I'm assuming you were listening. I can't tell who I put to sleep because I don't see it. Thank you, Joe. Um, we're going to turn over right now to the Q&A session, and I'd like to remind everyone to please um, make sure and uh, ask questions in the chat button on the left-hand corner of uh, the screen. And here is the first question to you, Joe. Is the bus related, for the BOSS-related work, do you assume a spherical source pattern? And if so, how good is that assumption? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, good question. In, 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 in the work presented here and, and so far, we do assume a spherically radiating source. Uh, the source is actually, uh, I think, an ITC, actual spherical source. I mean, the, the ceramic is spherical. And, and if it's left alone, radiating without being mounted to a structure, it is indeed spherical. When you mount it to the AUV, though, uh, that is not the case. We, we took the BOSS system into our million-gallon facility, and did some uh, very extensive calibration measurements of the source, ang uh, both the frequency dependence and the uh, angle dependence of it, and it is, it is quite non-spherical. And also some difference in the, in the waveform that one might predict from just using the electrical chirp waveform and the TVR curve from that source. So to take those things into account, we believe it's important, and in fact, we and others are working on ways to in integrate in this information we now have uh, into this processing uh, scheme. Thank you, Joe. And okay. what are the community notification requirements for UXO searches, recovery, and demolition? Um, I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat that? Yes. What are the community notification requirements for UXO searches, recovery, and demolition. Wow, uh, I wonder, I wonder if uh, if if Herb is listening, if he can answer that one. Herb, do you mind jumping in? Well, yeah, Herb is listening, but he he doesn't really know how to answer that one either. Uh, I think it depends upon which agency is doing this. If it's done under in a formally used defense site, so in general the Corps of Engineers would be in charge, there is a community outreach part of their effort. They often set up a restoration advisory board following the circular process, and so the community is involved like that. Certainly local law enforcement officials and site managers all know in advance when something's going to happen. Great. Thank you both. Um, another question for you, Joe. How will corrosion impact the echo data? Well, yeah, uh, that's a good point because um, what I've shown here and the work uh, and, and the targets we've used so far are pretty pristine targets. Uh, we do, I mentioned to you, we do fill them uh, carefully with epoxy materials so that we don't just have empty UXOs. However, uh, you know, if they sit in, in the environments that we're talking about for some period of time, they're apt to be some corrosion, biofouling, and so forth. And it turns out that uh, Assertup has just start, uh, just launched a little, a, a small project uh, to address to, to, to address that uh, question, uh, and and it's being done jointly by acoustics people to find out how echoes are affected, and also with electromagnetic induction people. Uh, to look at the same corroding effects and biofouling effects to see what effects it has on, on those, uh, those um, uh, modalities as well. So uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would suspect, though, that, uh, you know, for fair amounts of, of corrosion or biofouling, the effects on the very high-frequency imagers, which use, you know, just the surface of the target scattering, would be different. Uh, uh, effect from what we see on the structural acoustic domain where it's some, in some sense of some of the features are interior. Thank you, Joe. 
um, how will different sediment types affect the results? For example, would biogenic gas and organic sediments be a problem? Well, uh, to answer that, I guess I would, uh, my first thought would be I, I'd like to know something about the acoustic absorption in the band that we're exploiting. Uh, I'll bet you Kevin, Kevin Williams knows something about that. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, sure of what to say there, but I suspect the absorptions might be higher. Although I think that for, you know, targets buried a meter or so in the sediment, uh, we have a lot of room with most of these targets in terms of signal to noise. Even the uh, estimate I showed earlier uh, defined the the, uh, the range in terms of signal to noise being a factor of 10, so 20 dB signal to noise. So th there is room there, but uh, I think that would be predominantly uh, the, the the major effect. Of course, uh, in in the imaging processes, for example where we do time delay beam forming, if the speed of sound is quite different in the sediment, then one would have to take into account that. It would be almost like, you know, refraction and so forth effects that would have to be taken into account. Great, thank you. Um, Joe, this is a startup project. Well, what do you think the timeline is for a full technology demonstration? Ah, uh, well, uh, the timeline, well, for, uh, the, the the first question, I guess, would be to, uh, or the first issue would be to determine where and what is the, you know, what is the environment in which we're going to do that. Uh, so, so, for example, if it's in as a sort of coastal region that I sort of focused on the second part of, of my presentation, um, I believe that uh, since one thing is for certain, we can do straightforward imaging using uh, the boss type system on the buried targets. Uh, we certainly could do that. We, in terms of the classification from acoustic color, uh, that's gonna, that what we need to do there is develop techniques to train the algorithms. Uh, but even short of that, I would say that if you're willing to use a smart operator uh, who can observe the acoustic color spectra, that could add some you know, uh, information perhaps not, you know, uh, 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 you know, engineered, but some information to help the imaging process in terms of identifying. So, so it depends. If you want to do an environment like that, you know, 10, 10 to 120 feet in, in, in a coastal region, um, I, think, I think we could do a demonstration. Uh, it would take about a year to get ready for that and do it in the second year. Thank you. Okay, a specific question uh, related to the clutter and the nature of the clutter. Um, the the uh, audience member is asking or stating that most of the clutter shown in this presentation is non-metallic, whereas submerged US, UXO um, is metallic. Alternative technologies uh, such as magnetic and EM induction intrinsically make non-metallic clutter rejection simpler. So with that said, what is the advantage of acoustic systems over these alternative technologies? R right. Um, yeah, I think, uh, for, for, first of all, in the end, I think the, the, the hope has always been that, you know, we start off acoustically with sort of short range, uh, and that's what we're doing now. Uh, but the acoustic systems always have, the uh, the the advantage of moving to you know to larger to larger ranges and therefore area coverages that are you know coverage rates that are larger. Um, next, I I don't know much myself about you know for the berry targets what what uh, impact the uh, it, the depth it has on the uh, induction signals. Uh, perhaps the the uh, questioner knows more. I I don't know. Uh, they Probably, you know, the general answer would probably be that these modalities probably would be great companion modalities. In fact, uh, I believe uh, in the work of Bob Lesko, who used the BOSS system, he actually had, you know, uh, uh, a magne magnetometer-type system uh, on board uh, the, the, as well as the sonar. So I think, I think there's a, a lot of... Uh, a, a, of motivation for combining modalities and, and using them where they where they work best. 
Thank you, Joe. We have another 17 questions that have come in uh, for you, but we're going to ask you one more before we transition to our next speaker, and we'll try towards the end of the webinar to answer the remaining questions. So just in closing, can you please provide an opinion on how the use of multiple sonar frequencies may impact sea life? May, may impact what? Sea life. Um, I said in here the last word. Uh, sea life, uh, fish, oh, and oh, other oh. organisms. Okay. Um, the the again, just the general comment that at least up to this point, what we've been showing um, are fairly low levels uh, acoustically. That's number one, and number two. They're very short range, uh, and they're directed downward. Um, so there's, you know, compared to you know some of the problems uh, that one has to worry about with long range sonars, uh, th there I don't think there's uh, a major major problem in that regard here. Great, thank you so much, Joe, for a fascinating uh, presentation. And we're going to transition right now to our second speaker. Um, and uh, uh, I'd like to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Kevin Williams is a senior principal physicist and the chairman of the Ocean Acoustics Department at the University of Washington. Kevin received his PhD degrees in physics from Washington State University in Pullman. He worked at the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Panama City, Florida from 85 to 88 where he focused on acoustic scattering from finite bodies and propagation into ocean sediments. In 1988, he moved to the University of Washington, where his work focuses on underwater environmental and target acoustics. Um, Dr. Williams is a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kevin. Thank you. So. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever time zone you happen to be in. Um, what I hope to do is, today is to talk more about the low frequency acoustic scattering from an underwater UXO and its use in classification, and particular, try to um, talk about a broader uh, community. And I, I don't seem to have control over that. I'll go ahead and advance them to you okay. for you, Kevin. Okay. 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 Perfect. All right. So, so what I want to do is maybe give a broader context um, using as a basis a recent Acoustical Society of America special session, um, and in that context, I, the, several research institutions came together and gave um, talks about both the mine countermeasure issue and an unexploded ordnance issue. And the talks really expand the, the entire raw data to final classification processing chain. Now, I'll get a little bit more into what I mean by that in a second, but what I hope to do in addition is to help pose some questions, identify some needs for those who are looking to assist in solving the problem. So by way of outline, I, I'm going to start um, by setting a context including the risks and the challenges inherent in the underwater UXO remediation effort. And then I, throughout the talk, I'm going to use a basic set of building blocks that discusses some of the current research aimed at addressing those uh, building blocks, going all the way from the target uh, data acquisition all the way to the final classification. And really, in particular, what you do in low frequency acoustics. Now, uh, as a disclaimer, anyone someone's trying to present a summary of a lot of people's work, obviously, I'm going to give you a perspective that certainly will not be necessarily the perspective of any of the presenters at the Acoustic Society meeting. And those presenters are really only a subset of the presenters or, or work efforts that are going on both in the United States and certainly in Europe. So with that caveat, um, we'll go on to a context. So a place to get a, a context for, for the uh, level of the problem is via two workshop proceedings, uh, workshops that occurred in 2007 and 2013. Um, and I, I'll give you a couple of excerpts from that. The first one is, uh, it just indicates this is a big problem. The estimates are um, 
The aerial density or aerial estimates is somewhere in the excess of 10 million acres. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers themselves have more than 400 underwater formerly used defensive sites that are contaminated with munitions. And Navy Munitions Response Program currently has another 57 closed and active sites that could have munitions. And so the problem is large. In addition, a lot of those UXO are probably buried. So the picture over to the bottom right is an indication of a buried target. The only reason you know it is because we actually marked it with those two, yellow, two uh, kind of pink tabs, but that's uh, buried somewhere around uh, 20 centimeters below a mud interface. Next. So also by way of context, what are the challenges? Joe had mentioned some of these. Uh, you've got low visibility a lot of times in the, in the environment that you want to work in. Uh, you have a limited range of E&M kind of energy. You may have even more attenuation of both the E&M and acoustics uh, in the ocean sediments. It's expensive to remediate as compared to the land case, and the things don't stay in place. Uh, waves and currents will cause the UXO to move. So the challenge is to make informed decisions on remedi remediation versus the risk of leaving the UXO in place. So what are those risks? Obviously, uh, recreational users that, that uh, we're hoping to allow back into those areas um, can suffer due to unexpected or, or, um, UXO detonation. Or even if that doesn't happen, the environmental impacts of release of the internal material in the UXO can also cause harm. So what do we need? We need some principled methods to assess the risks and thus make informed decisions on remediation versus leave in place with monitoring to continue to assess the risk. Why do we use acoustics? As we said, it's lower attenuation than the electromagnetics. Why low frequency acoustics in that 1 to 50 or 1 to 30 kilohertz range? Um, because the scattering does include, from the target, includes information in addition to the shape and because we can penetrate deeper into the sediments as the frequency goes down. And again, as Joe mentioned, you know, the, at a kilohertz, the attenuation is not going to really bother you. At 100 kilohertz, you're not going to be able to see into the sediment, even for a case of a simple sand sediment. So. What are the classification steps? I'm going to use this uh, black diagram throughout uh, the rest of the talk. That diagram is really set um, for the particular way we did it, but, but the point is, no matter how you do it, you're going to go through these steps. You're going to need raw data. Somehow from that raw data, you're going to create some sort of data product. I show here acoustic color. You're probably going to whiten it. You're going to normalize it in some way. And you're going to, from, the, from those data products, create some kind of features. Uh, the example I'll show is using 2D cross-correlations, but a feature choice is very important. From that point, it's, it's a matter of classification. Um, a lot of times, uh, a nonlinear kernel is used to separate out um, the features a little better, and then you put it into some sort of classifier. And the ASA special session had talks that actually went in one or more of all of these blocks. So the end goal, of course, is you want a high probability of classification. You want uh, very few false alarms. And the penalty in each case, whether it's false positive or false negative, is, is large. Which is worse? That's probably a matter of opinion. What is acceptable is something that definitely the sponsors and the community and, and, and the greater community of recreational users are, are probably going to have a vote in. The question we have to answer is how to re receive the desired performance. Next. So I'm going to start with the raw data. Uh, there were several institutions that presented um, raw data efforts. Uh, us at Applied Physics Lab, um, Joe and his um, collaborators at Naval Research Lab, the people at Naval Coastal Systems Center, uh, TNO in Netherlands, Washington State University. And the kind of experimental data varies all the way from tank experiments that are done at WSU that try to elucidate the physics in scale modeled situations, rail based ocean ex experiments that we do that are, are set to control the uh, geometry of the source and receiver, 
uh, over the side systems and then the type of autonomous system that uh, BOSS represents. Next. So what do you get? In the, in the simplest sense, the top right picture is an example of what you would get if you run a sonar by a target. Um, the time is on a horizontal axis from 12 to 15 milliseconds. Cross range spans over 12 meters. And at zero meter cross range, you're reaching the point of closest approach of the target. And every ping, you fill up one of the horizontal lines on this picture. So you end up getting this very typical hyperbola whenever you look at an individual target. The point of experiments, however, is that they're expensive to carry out. You can usually only do a limited number of targets, a limited number of geometries, environments. But we have been able to progress to the point of what's shown in the bottom right, where we can put a large number of targets in a field of view. Um, in that case, there's approximately 28 targets in, the, in that field of view. And the question of how do you separate those targets is one that uh, Tim Marston, when he was uh, both at WSU and at Naval Coastal Service, uh, Worker Center uh, did a lot of work to allow us uh, techniques by which we can take an image like that, uh, do some SAS imaging, separate out a target, and then recapture basically the picture at the top right. At the moment, we have uh, raw data sets on multiple targets at multiple ranges that are available for others. Uh, there's a set of data that is public release um, if people want it. Um, they need to contact me. And then there's a set of distribution D uh, data that can also be obtained if you have the, uh, a contract in place uh, with the Navy. Next. So because it's hard to do uh, and expensive to get raw data from experiments, there's a real need to do models that allow you to augment that data. Again, several institutions are working on this. In addition to the ones I mentioned before, uh, Heat, Light, and Sound in California is also working on that. And we, we all use a variety of methods. Um, we use numerical methods um, from uh, a very uh, long-running uh, historical T-matrix approach to 3D finite element kind of approaches, both at NSWC, at NRL, and also at Heat, Light, and Sound. And then in axisymmetric targets, you can actually use uh, 2D kind of uh, models. But regardless, in most cases, you only use finite elements to model the local environment, maybe including the sediment interface. But you propagate back to your receiver using some sort of uh, wave theory. Alternative to these kind of things and actually augmenting them are physical acoustics uh, models that are, are aimed at actually understanding the target physics that one sees in these kind of um, scattered returns. And it attempts to make the whole process faster by using ray-based propagators for far field calculations. Next. So the reality of, of the situation, of course, is that the target scattering depends on the location and where you are in that environment. But the goal of the model is to produce stave level raw data to augment experimental data for more targets and more geometries, essentially to reduce the cost in doing training. You also want to understand the physics. And if you can, if the goal is to identify robust features, even if they may uh, not be uh, stationary as when um, looked at as a function of range or angle. But in the end, the requirement is to have high fidelity that includes elastic composition, but also have high speed. So the picture on the right is actually a comp composite of experimental data for a two-foot aluminum cylinder, and then model data without the elastic effects. And as you can see in the experimental data, there's a lot of late arriving energy that doesn't show up in the model data. And that's that late arriving energy that has a lot of the composition information in it. And indeed, the more modern models that are, are being done do include the fidelity needed in order to capture that elastic um, energy and, the, and to be able to produce what looks like real data. Next. So now you, you've Obviously, once you've got the data, you've got to go to the next block, which is developing data products. Um, there's been processing, as Joe pointed out in the 
XY regime with synthetic aperture. There's also been XT, holographic kind of processing. Uh, we've done acoustic color kind of processing. There's obviously a lot of other things you could do with the raw data, and some of the questions that need to be answered are what other things can you do with, that, with this data. And in particular, can you find spaces where you can better separate out elastic physics and shape physics? And can you combine results from different spaces to improve classification? So on the right at the top, what I show is raw data for a target, same target, two different ranges, 15 meters and 40 meters. At the bottom is the acoustic color for those two uh, sets of raw data, just pointing out that the target looks different depending on the range via acoustic color. Next. So to kind of drive that point home, uh, I'm showing a model and data results um, for a uh, aluminum UXO. The model's at the top with four different ranges, 10, 15, 30, and 40 meters. The actual ocean data from, from T-Rex 13 is on the bottom. Um, a point to be made is at least that the model generally captures the changes that you see. Uh, another point to be made is that at 15 meters range, both in the data and the model, there's actually a uh, optimal from the standpoint of getting the most information across the broadest frequency range and across the, the most angles. So there are things to learn by looking at the models that then are shown up in the experimental data and allow you to make predictions for how you might want to do your operations. Next. So the other data product is, is the synthetic aperture sonar processing. The left picture here is the same one I showed earlier where the, the bottom arc is for the model without elastic effects. The top arc includes elastic effects. If you look at the right side, what I've pointed out is that the model without those elastic effects obviously has no late energy coming in, whereas the elastic effects where a lot of the composition information is, is um, later in time. And to drive that home, we'll go to the next view graph. And this is on the farthest right at the top is a picture uh, similar to what I showed in the previous view graph of a two to one aluminum cylinder, and there's two yellow boxes that separate out early energy and late energy. This was work that uh, Tim Marston did and, and Phil Marston did at, at Washington State University. And the question is, is if you take the early energy, the first yellow box, and you just grab that, that data, and then you uh, do a transform, you can get the frequency um, behavior of just the shape response. And that's shown in blue in the middle uh, graph. So you can see oscillations due to um, the structure and the shape. Whereas if you can grab the late energy, you get the black dotted line, a point being that that late energy is elastic, and you can understand the peak that you see at about 7 kilohertz is due to a particular elastic effect. Next. So we've got the raw data. We've got some sort of data products. Now we want to grab features out of that. What you really want is something that's robust to the change in environment geometry, and you would like to have something that's sensitive to composition, um, and you'd like it to exploit the physics. Now, what's true is that, again, the, the response, even the raw data, is going to change as a function of angle and frequency. And you would like to minimize that, but that is a basic uh, fact of life in looking at these kind of uh, acoustic responses. So what Joe showed earlier were, were two kinds uh, of features that people have used, uh, the image-based kind of feature at the top right. Um, and this looks at the symmetry of the image and, and relies on the fact that uh, clutter a lot of times does not have that kind of symmetry. On the other hand, the acoustic colors at the bottom right, um, if you, you can take those, you can do various things with them. One of the things you can do is do cross correlations between acoustic color templates. And from that, you can create a feature that tells you, allows you to dis make decisions on target or non-target. But what we know we need I, I believe the community as a whole would say this, is that there certainly needs to be more and better features. 
And there's certainly insight that they can gain from other communities, whether it's music or speech. Obviously, the music industry has spent billions of dollars to satisfy our iPhone fix. So there's got to be something to learn from those kind of communities to better pick features. Next. So now we've got features we have to classify. What I'm going to do is show you an example of some of the complications that ensue in this classification by using the acoustic color uh, as a feature set. And I'm doing this because it's simple and it's been implemented by several groups. Uh, it, it certainly has its deficiencies. You know, it, it, it by definition inherently incorporates target physics, but it really doesn't exploit the physical understanding of, of target scattering. And again, what we need, what's needed to, to, to proceed is to really go all the way back to the first building block, start at the raw data, and develop data products, features, and so on that, that take further advantage of both other communities and the physics we know is, is at play here. Next. So this black diagram now is exactly what we do and the stuff that we, we have done in the classification. Uh, we take the raw data, we make acoustic color templates, we whiten it, we normalize it, um, then we take these templates and we do cross correlations, and those cross correlation values are our features. We put it through a Gaussian uh, kind of filter, and then we use an RVM machine. Now, it would be great in a perfect world to have a kernel that totally separated targets from non targets, that all non targets would give perfect correlations with each other at all aspects and all ranges that all targets would look exactly alike at all aspects and all ranges, and that if you replace an experimentally derived feature with a model feature, you would get exactly the same result. That, of course, is not what happens, but in the next few graphs, I show what this perfect kernel would look like in, uh, the, in the world we're working in. So what we have on the far right is actually a matrix there's about 450 by 450 elements. So this matrix is, is um, an example of what you would want to have happen for the targets that are shown on both axes. So these targets, there's targets um, on the vertical axes from 1 to 30. And some of the targets, for instance, target number 7, we have views at several different ranges. So what you would like to have is that the um, kernel would be block diagonal. And that would say that every target looked like a target at every range and at every aspect. And every non-target would look like itself and only itself at every range and at every aspect. So that's what you'd like to have. You'd like to figure out something that did this kind of separation. Now what do you really have in the case of this kind of uh, acoustic color cross correlation? That's shown on the next view graph. So the next view graph is what the, what the kernel really looks like using the ocean data from um, T-Rex 13. Now the heavy red block is a block of targets that are the same size. They aren't all targets. That are, we, didn't, we didn't deem them as targets in our, in our effort, in our classification effort, but they're about the same size. And you can see that anything that's red says that these things are kind of correlated to each other. The other problem, children, of course, are the ones in the lighter red boxes, either vertical or horizontal. Anything outside the dark red box that has a red color means there's a non-target that looks like a target. And so what you'd like to have is those, those two light red boxes there have only blue within them so that you had a total separation of target and non-target. Um, that simply doesn't happen, but the goal, of course, is to make uh, a feature set and a process that would do as well as possible on that. But given what we're doing here, then the question is, how good do we do? And that's the next picture. So this is a, a classification effort that used a relevance vector machine and a kernel that you just saw. On the right is training data. On the left is testing data. Um, the, the rock curves are a little blocky because of the limited amount of data we have. There's 10 curves, 10 black curves, and 10 green curves because 
we ran ten different uh, examples. Uh, I ran a, we ran the RVM ten different times because it's sensitive to where you start. But the point is, is that in training, the area under the curve averages about 0.93 if you use experimental templates. And it actually does better if you replace the experimental templates with the model templates and gets to about 0.95. That just says the model templates are cleaner in some sense and probably says they don't really look like the data as much. And that shows up in the a, uh, right hand side in the training rock curves in the fact that when you train with experimental data and test with experimental data, you get an area under the curve of about 0.89. But if you train on model data, and test on experimental data, that area under the curve or your performance goes down slightly to about 0.85. Still, um, the modeling does a fairly good job at producing what's seen in the experiment, at least via this particular metric that we're using. Next. So again, let me stop by, by reiterating that this is a big problem. Right? We have 10 million acres potentially that, that we need to think about where we want to detect and we want to classify. And we want to make principled choices on when to remediate uh, where it's necessary. The low frequency acoustic kind of structural stuff is certainly one modality through which you can detect and classify. It has some advantages. You can look out further. There's some very rich features that are there. But the fact is, those rich features also probably uh, complicate matters a little bit. So the question is, what is the performance? I think we, we as a community, I think, have a good handle on being able to go all the way from the raw data to the final product uh, of uh, performance uh, on classification. But the question of what is the acceptable rock curve is not one that we can answer, obviously, but one that needs to be answered by a larger community. And then once we have what is an acceptable rock curve, where do we need to operate on that rock curve? To get an acceptable rock curve may need, indeed, other modalities, right? The high frequencies Joe talked about, E&M, magnetics, they're, they're probably a combination of modalities that we need to get to, but we need to get to where we understand our individual modalities first. Next. So from the low frequency standpoint only, we are still data limited. We probably will, in its essence, be always data limited because you can't do every target in every environment that you want to work in. So you need to be able to have well-tested um, models that you can use to augment your experimental data sets. And we feel, again, I think the community would say we have various techniques that, that we use now that seem to be up to the task, at least for the models we've taken on to date. But yeah, we're probably not near as far along on, on asking questions about the right classification factors um, to use in order to better exploit the physics. And we definitely need to um, broaden our classification strategies and to try to understand the features and classification efforts of the music community, speech community, and the biosonar community. In essence, when you look at that bottom um, block diagram, there are things to do in each one of those. And, and individual uh, institutions can do one of those, can do multiple of those, but it will probably take a, a large set of community uh, institutions um, to optimize what we think we can do both in low-frequency acoustics and more broader with other kinds of energy. Next. So if uh, you want any additional information, there's the website, which may have been given earlier. But with that, uh, I would take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, we have received a number of questions, and I'm going to go ahead and start getting these questions to you. But as a reminder for our audience, please feel free to input your questions uh, via the chat function on the left-hand side of the screen. All right, Kevin, for starters, how can a person obtain public release data sets? So, so the best way to get the public release data sets is just send me email directly. I can give people 
a Dropbox location that they can download uh, the data set and an explanation of what the data actually is and how to look at it. All right, and just as a reminder for everyone, um, you can download a PDF of the slides from the Sort of ESCCP webinar series webpage, and you can go back to the slide that contains uh, Kevin's information and reach out to him via email in that manner. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, what about additional details on the finite modeling efforts? How do folks access this information? So, so the, probably the best way to start to access the information is is simply go to, to the journals, to the Acoustic Society of America Journal, and to the uh, Journal of Ocean Engineering, IEEE. Um, it, if they're, again, interested, uh, we can certainly put on the names of people you should search on um, at the, from the various institutions, and you will probably get um, enough articles to keep you busy for quite some time, uh, many of which will, will talk about the finite element um, efforts. Thank you. And can you give us examples of uh, elastic physics seen in low frequency acoustics data? Yeah, so I, I want to classify that kind of in two different ways. Um, if you look at the lower end of the low frequency, let's say, you, you can actually see the shape um, resonate as a whole. So there are instances in, in the acoustic color where you can actually see a full body excitation of energy. Um, you, as you go up in frequency, um, you have things such as surface waves and relay waves that are running either along a target or on the face of that target. And again, some of that kind of physics, if you go into the references, you'll, you'll see um, where various groups have break it apart, broken apart the uh, acoustic color and, and the time domain images and the spatial images and pointed out those kind of effects that you see. Great. And how do you separate overlapping targets? So that you know, that's a, that's a good question to ask Dr. Timothy Marston. But he has a a uh, article, and and maybe uh, at some point, uh, again, the best thing may be to do is to have for him to tell you where that article is, because I can't tell you. I think it's an oceans meeting. Um, but it gives a full explanation on, on how we have uh, developed, uh, used this processing in order to do the separation. And we've been able to separate targets that are, you know, are one meter apart um, without too much difficulty in the kind of uh, controlled experiments that we do anyway. Wonderful. Uh, can you please comment about the use of T-matrix in the modeling compared to other models like finite element methodologies? Um, again, so now, so now this is sure to get me in trouble when I give an opinion on this kind of stuff. But um, what I think the T-matrix has been able to do is, is be able to do um, elongated cylinders, um, now fairly large aspect ratio of cylinders. Um, but hasn't really been able to can do the kind of um, detail modeling that you can do with a finite element from the standpoint of having, for instance, a UXO that has a bunch of ridges in it, that has a knob at the back end, that has um, maybe holes that are drilled in it or inside of it that are, that are um, filled with water or air or, or epoxy. Those kind of things are harder to do, but on the other hand, you can you can reach in and, and get a lot of target physics out of a T matrix kind of model to start with. Great, thank you. And um, can can you comment on whether multiple source interference can lead to increased re resolution for this technique? <laughs> I mean, if, 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 is the question. I'm not sure what the question is, but if the question is, can you do so, uh, some sort of interferometry, um, that certainly has been and can be done uh, with, with multiple receivers. You could probably do it with multiple sources also. Um, I can't comment other than that because I don't know really the nature of the question. Okay. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I have some questions that have come in that are applicable to both you and Joe, so I'd like us to um, have you take turns uh, answering these questions. 
Again, one is um, about target users and end users and the status of uh, these state-of-the-art technologies. When do you believe, Kevin, that these techniques uh, can be used in the field for some actual um, remediation work? Yeah, well, so, so I think that the low-frequency stuff is obviously still in, in its um, development phase, so I think that's a few years out. I, I think um, perhaps some of the stuff that, that uh, Joe's done with, with uh, the high frequency and low frequency, I, I would agree that you could take BOSS out and probably run it over fields. So I think the sophistication needed to develop the whole chain from raw data to final classification is something that, that is probably a, a few years out. All right. Uh, Joe, would you like to comment on that and perhaps Herb also? Um, uh, Joe first? Yes, please. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's hard to, uh, to, to uh, specify that. As I said, it, it's, it depends so much on, on the uh, region that we're going to try to do something. It depends on what we expect to be the targets. Do we know anything about those targets? I mean, that sort of drives the development of uh, the, the training of the classifier. For example, if we, if we kind of know we're looking for specific targets that are there, five-inch rockets, for example, I believe that we can actually do a fairly good job training almost numerically. But if we're going out somewhere and we have no idea what UXOs we're looking for, um, then that's another matter. So I think, I think a specific answer to that question is really driven by uh, what is you know what is the situation where what are we looking for uh, and so forth. I think there are some cases, no question in my mind, there are some cases where we could go out fairly soon and do a reputable job. Thank you, Joe. Herb, would you like to add to this? Yeah, I would like to address that. I actually appreciate that both of our speakers are so optimistic about these techniques that they'll be in the water next year doing these things. I think that we to do a round of validation, though, through ESTCP will take the kind of times that both of the speakers have talked about, two or three years, and then we would have good performance reports from test sites, and we can really start talking about applying this in munitions response. Thank you, Herb. And one last question for you and Joe. How does the sort of remediation mission compare to the Navy mine countermeasure mission, and how might this affect fielded system design? <laughs> Joe, you want me to go first? Or you want to well, uh, well, well um, I'm not sure what I can comment on the on the naval mine stuff, but go ahead. Yeah, you, Herb, you go first. Well, I, I'm certainly not going to talk about any technical details, but I'm just going to remind the uh, questioner and the rest of the audience that there are several big differences. Munitions response is not a time-critical, tactical need sort of thing. Mine countermeasures may well be. If the Marines are getting ready to hit the beach, you know, in the World War II uh, movie version, and then something may have to happen now. In munitions response in general, the targets have been there for 50 or 60 years since World War II training. If we get to them next week, it's the same as getting to them the week after that. So we definitely don't have the tactical uh, time scale requirement. And it's a much luckier thing. Nobody's shooting at us while we're doing this, and they may be shooting at you if you were doing countermine. So there's a lot of the um, things and things that drive the cost of a countermine effort that that are that don't apply to uh, munitions response. Uh, Joe talked about having a smart operator in the loop earlier in his talk. That's certainly something that we can do and might likely do in the munitions response versus a completely automated system. So uh, we spend a fair amount of time trying to reorient the thinking of the countermeasures, mine countermeasures people when they get to the munitions response problem. Yeah, and if I, I could add to that, that uh, the, the, the rapid, uh, you know, clearance issue with respect to the mines uh, translates in, in, into uh, range, being, you know, being, having to be able to do fairly large coverage areas, which means range. And since we don't have that time limitation, although time is money, but, but it's not as bad as in a Navy mission problem, uh, we, you know, we can go to shorter ranges. And, uh, and that's good because why? Because mines tend to be a lot bigger than the UXO we're looking for. Great. Well, um, 
thank you uh, both Joe and Herb. And uh, on behalf of Startup on ESCCP, I would like to thank all of our speakers today and also thank our audience for attending today's webinar. Um, as a reminder, the presentation and audio will be archived for future reference on the Startup ESCCP webpage. You can actually download the PDF today and the video um, and audio can be downloaded in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the next webinar in the series is on Thursday, February 19th, and it will focus on um, increased rooftop solar efficiency beyond flat panel TVs. We will have two speakers on that webinar, Deborah Jellen um, from Electric Core and also um, John Archibald from American Solar. So you'll be hearing an industry perspective on this topic. Um, and you can register for this webinar today by going to the CERTIP and ESCCP uh, uh, webpage um, and accessing um, the uh, link uh, on the screen. So with that, before we hang up, I'd like to ask everybody to please take a moment of your very busy day to complete a very short survey um, that will pop up on your screen when the webinar ends. The survey results um, help us in, future, in planning future webinars. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone again, and this concludes today's webcast.